Hi, everybody, and welcome back to our podcast from the Kama Sutra to 2020, where we look at your questions, your concerns, even your worries around all things to do with sex and sexuality. So unfortunately, once again, we don't have Dr. Anvita Madan Behel with us today due to medical reasons, but we have in her stead the fabulous Nina Claire. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Nina. Nina is a well-being crusader. And in a previous avatar, Nina used to head the editorial team for the well-being magazine at uh, BW Business World. But she's shifted her focus since then. She's now looking at psychosexual uh, dynamics in connection with mental health. And today she brings her perspective to the advice that the Kama Sutra has to give. Welcome, Nina. Thank you so much for the introduction, Seema, and thank you for having me. I'm, I'm so excited to be here and very grateful to Anvita for connecting us. Well, it's a delight to have you because um, as you know that this is a platform where we try and respond to all the questions and the messages that we get around sex and sexuality because people have very few other places that they can go to for advice or for good advice anyway. And today we've got you on here because we really want your advice on a particular issue which I've been getting a lot of emails about and we haven't had a chance to address it yet. And that is that, you know, when you look at sex and everybody says, oh, sex is a taboo subject, we found that within that arena of taboo, there are some things that are higher up on the list of taboo. And I think the topmost taboo is women and pleasure, particularly as women get older. So we've been getting a lot of emails from people like women who are in their 40s, particularly, um, you know, once you have a child, then you're just supposed to not be a sexual being anymore, because it's like, you've got a child and you've got a teenage child and how can you be thinking about sex? Or women who have been in a marriage for a while and their husband is really, really bad in bed, but they're never supposed to want anything different. It's always like, well, he's a very good man otherwise. So you don't dishonor him by saying that, um, you know, that the sexual side of things is not satisfactory. You're not supposed to want it. And when you become single, it's like, that's it. If you're 40 and single, you're not supposed to be a sexual being altogether. And actually, you have a great term that you coined for that particular situation, don't you? Um, <laughs> to our audiences, because I, I love that. So I coined the term recycled virgin. And um, I kind of realized, you know, when I got divorced, when I came back to India, that when you're single, you're supposed to be absolutely virginal. When you get married, you're supposed to be a goddess in bed. And then when you get divorced and you're single all over again, you're supposed to be a recycled virgin all over again. All over so, again. So um, that's what, and that's where the taboo really comes in, right? Because you're expected to have zero desire, which is bullshit. Because actually what happens is that when you're, we're, we're talking about our 40s essentially, right? That when you're in your 40s, you're peaking and, and your desires are at their all-time high. And most likely you've been able to discover what you like and what you don't like. Yes, you're so right. 40s is when women really come into themselves and this is where judgment really starts to pile on on them. Sorry, I just want to say that I'm, I'm sorry if the light on me is changing drastically, but as many of you know, I am in the UK and um, we are having a particularly cold and gray and awful winter. And today, just as I managed to sit by the main French windows by my garden, the sun has come out in all its glory and it's blinding me. So if you think that the light is looking weird, please excuse me for this. Nina, of course, is in fabulous Kasoli at the moment. Nina, are you all sunny and bright and beautiful over there? It's been a, a bit of a tease today. The sun's been playing hide and seek, coming and going, but it's a glorious day over here today. Well, okay, so it looks like it might be a cold and uh, sunny day over here. So I'm sorry. I'm sure it'll go behind a cloud any minute. Um, so I'll just carry on. Um, so Nina, actually, this is what I want to talk to you about today. Women in their 40s and how to deal with their sexuality and all the other problems that are starting to come up around it. Because it almost seems like they're trapped in a situation and they don't know what to do. It's almost like you have to kill yourself off sexually to be able to conform to the rules of society. Now, you said you mentioned that um, you are single, that you've been through a divorce uh, recently, is it? 
No, no, it's been many years. It's been many years. Okay. So uh, I guess what I want you to start with is what, let's begin with the idea that you're still in a marriage and the mm -hmm. sex is really, really bad. I mean, your husband is an uninspiring sexual partner yeah. and you really would mm -hmm. like better satisfaction. What do you re recommend for women to do? I mean, you know, a lot of them just go very silent, but it's obviously playing on their minds. Absolutely. You know, um, I, I've given this topic a lot of thought and what I've realized is over the years of observing people and having conversations and interviewing people is that um, it's not so much the what, it's the why. Why are we in this situation? And I think that, um, that we as, as women come from a position of being sexually repressed in society, right? And we're not really wired to uh, communicate our desires, to express our desires. And I think if one takes a step back a little bit, it's not even about expressing because so many times you don't even know what you want. So um, one of the things that I did when I came back to India, I, because my background is in psychology and I'm a complete therapy junkie, I went into therapy and I tried to, um, to find myself, to discover myself. And one of the things that worked for me beautifully was that I did an exercise of of, in, of listing down what my wants were in life, what I wanted. And I realized, Seema, that once my thoughts became clear about my wants, it wasn't so easy even to communicate them. So then you start with the smaller things that, you know, Seema, if I were to ask, uh, uh, you know, somebody um, that I want a particular act in bed, I don't even know how to verbalize that. So start with even the, the most inane things, the small things to learn to express oneself. So when somebody I feel is caught in a union where they're not getting what they want, my first and foremost um, recommendation always is marital therapy, counseling therapy, and um, without generalizing Seema, more often than not, I've seen that men are not really up for, for therapy. Is that, is that what you've observed as well? Yeah, unfortunately, there is this thing about, it's almost like an aspersion on the masculine. Um, most of them won't accept that it could be a two-way problem. Yes, so, um, so what I've realized also is over the years that it's a function of, um, of your very being because your sexual life is a representation of your very being. So evaluate what, what's happening with you. I think that's where it really begins. And if, you, if you're, your partner is willing to go for therapy, you yourself go for therapy. And many people say they can't afford therapies. Then I say, work on yourself, evaluate, really connect with yourself. And the more you become in connection with yourself is when you realize what your desires are. So Seema, if I'm an aggressive person, you know, personally, when I'm in bed, I'm, it, it's more likely that I'll be um, aggressive in bed as well. And if I don't have um, the vocabulary or the confidence to communicate in my day-to-day -day life, I'm barely going to have the confidence to communicate that in bed either. So I think it's a lot of introspection, evaluation, talk therapy, writing helps a lot is what I feel. And, you know, worst case scenario, Seema, I mean, I, 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 I don't like to um, stand on moral ground. So worst case scenario, if it isn't working, then look at maybe opening up your marriage. And if that isn't an option, then, then you know, maybe, maybe um, step out of the union. Because sex is a very important part of one's life and well-being, actually. I agree with you. And I think, actually, this point that you made about seeking therapy, even if your partner won't agree to it, and if you feel you can't afford it or you can't go to it without more judgment being put on you, there's a lot of online courses and therapy sessions that you can attend for free, aren't there? Absolutely. In fact, today I, I, I received um, an entire database of 60 places where you can get free therapy. I was so impressed. That's amazing. That is really fantastic. One of the other things that's been coming up in these emails is a lot of women say that because they have young children or teenage children, that it's almost like, how can you even be thinking about sex? You know, you've got grown up children. What will they think? You know, I think it's, uh, it's rather unfair, but that that's actually the reality. But I mean, logically speaking, your desire doesn't die because you're a mother. Your desire doesn't die because you're, you're single. It, it still exists. So I think it's very important to, to assert oneself. Even if you're a single mother, even if you're single in your 40s, it's okay to have desire. It's part and parcel of who yeah. you are. And I think, you know, you can't look at yourself. I'm sorry, Seema, I mean, I have to uh, make this point that it's really important that you don't um, look at yourself in a, in a unilateral sort of way. 
there's so many facets to your being so while you're a mother doesn't mean you can't be a porn star doesn't mean that you can't be a sex goddess doesn't mean that you can't be like a you know a ceo of a company you can be all of that together they're all parts of your your being yeah absolutely but i was also going to say that if you at that point decide to repress it i mean nobody's saying that you should go out and um you know shout about it to your children or shout about it to the world but if you repress yourself completely i'm sure that impacts the psyche of your child as well and then we're just perpetuating the narrative absolutely because then what i'm telling my child is that uh, that mama only has this facet of her personality mama works and mama's a mama and mama's you know nani nanu's daughter and pitu's sister but that's not true mama's a woman mama has desires mama has wants and your wants should be fulfilled and that is actually a conversation i've had with my daughter quite recently she's 13 now and i'm actually not allowed to talk about her because you know it's not there's no consent over here but um i i can definitely divulge this much that she's understood the fact that mama is a woman and that's happened very recently actually so <laughs> but well, talking about consent actually that brings me to the next thing quite um, organically uh, consent is a huge issue when it comes to i find women as they get older in their sexual relationships so if you are in a relationship if you're in a marriage where the sexual side of things is not great uh, women tend to get bored they will back off they'll find other things to do and then there this idea of consent becomes a little bit of an issue do you think you know i've really observed this you know seema and um, shockingly not not only in people who are in their 40s 50s or 60s when they're talking about being in in unions where they're not comfortable and they're not being asked what they really want but even in my friends who are in their 20s and 30s that they don't know that it's okay to say no because we're brought up um even even the youngsters to be people pleasers to a large extent so we're not educated so yes i'm very happy uh, i've been observing for years now that you know in schools one talks about good touch and bad touch right where it's it's all over the place at least in private schools that i see but no one teaches you about consent no one teaches you about the importance of being able to say no yes say no to a bad touch but if you're with somebody it's like no it, you know that person might feel bad and i've had, i've had friends who in their first experience of sex it hasn't been good and they said no and their partners have have just plowed through i think it's so awful you're so right i was just going to say that funnily enough you know in the kama sutra now people think that this is a book written 2000 years ago it actually says that on the very first time that you're with a woman you do not actually have sex you wait either 3 days 6 days or 9 days before wow. depending on the kind of person she is yeah before you have sex so you actually bring her to that point emotionally you excite her desires by a lot of other things so that she wants it in the end and yeah you don't plow through but that we do have this terrible sort of idea that if you are married the moment you become mrs so and so you no longer have the right to say no you know seema i actually have a friend who's um, in her 40s and she has an open marriage and um, so which means she has multiple partners so she's open to 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 that extent but um quite recently what happened with her was that she was having sex with somebody who she's recently met and without her permission he inserted her finger into her anus and she said oh my god nina i felt so violated just because i'm open and i have an open marriage doesn't mean that i'm open to everything he should have at least asked me and this is an emancipated woman who's you know travel the world who's educated who's confident and she had a problem saying no you know wow yeah yeah it really is an issue i mean i find that and and you know these things are so subtle that a lot of times when they said in company in groups or at a party or in a discussion between friends a lot of people will either laugh it off or make a joke of it and i think that it's so important because people are reaching out at that point you know they've got this this problem and it is something that's bothering them so i think it's really fantastic that um, 
we're being able to address it today. And Seema, you know, I'd like to add to that. I feel it has to be a multi-pronged approach. So we're talking about, you know, how education is important. And that's how the narrative actually changes. You know, you and I are, are hardly going to change. We're going to probably, um, you know, include things in our repertoire, but the actual script changes when you talk about education, right? So education, not only at school, not only in college, but even your gynecologists. And if somebody reaches out to you and tells you that they have a problem, um, as a support system, family and friends should be educated about being supportive and that there are actual places where you can go for redressal. There are cells where you can go and get support if something's done to you against your consent. I'm talking in, in extreme situations. So if you're in a marriage and you go, uh, you know, and, and, your, and your spouse has abused you or you're in a domestic relationship with somebody and you've been abused, you can actually go and seek help with the domestic violence uh, wing, you know. I think that's a really good thing to know. And it, it, are these also like free cells and things where absolutely. you can go or is it something? Absolutely. So when I came back to India, um, I had had a, uh, you know, my, my divorce was very nasty and I went to the domestic violence, um, you know, wing. And the thing was, there was no physical violence. There was a lot of emotional violence and a lot of other stuff that had happened. And I thanked God a million times, Seema, when I went there because there were women, and I'm not exaggerating, women walking with their legs apart because they had been so brutally mutilated. But yes, it's a little difficult. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's um, uh, the domestic violence wing. It's, it's, it's supposed to be, you know, a wing where anybody and everybody can go, but even to get entry sometimes is a problem. You have to prove that you've been back you enough. What we... Oh God, yeah. Um, I tell you what we can do is that when we finish, when we actually put this episode up, we will put down some of the links to these places that you mentioned Absolutely. in the description. Absolutely. So uh, maybe that would be useful for people. Okay, one of the other questions that's been coming up a lot, um, and this is really interesting as far as I'm concerned, that the, uh, the guilt that is attached to wanting your sexual desires to be fulfilled. And not just simple, straightforward, or oh, I feel guilty because, you know, um, we are supposed to be good girls and good girls don't want this. But these are women now in their 40s, they're emancipated. Many of them are single women in relationships and so on. And yet this point of guilt is still coming through to the point where I've been receiving, you wouldn't believe how many emails from people saying that, you know, I'm fine with it. I'm a sexual being. I have a great partner, but my family is very conservative. And now I'm starting to feel guilty about having sex on certain days. So if I've said, if I've been to the temple in the morning, is it okay to have sex at night? Or if it is a particular festival or a fast, can I have sex on that particular day? And I'm actually blown away by this this question because i've been trying to say to people this is not a bad thing it's not a sin why feel guilty but this guilt is actually multiplying yeah you know um if we go by our calendar seema i think we're never going to have sex but uh <laughs> yeah but yeah we have a yeah, festival but, on every day every day but 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 jokes aside i think you know um when there's a topic that's associated with morality, the higher the morality attached to a topic, the more the guilt that is attached to a topic. And when we come to religion, I think there's no logic. But I mean, I would invite whoever is writing into you to consider um, a, a modicum of practicality, that if you're engaging in sex, it's an act of love or passion or whatever it is. So consider the fact that there's nothing wrong with it, right? First of all, um, and, and secondly, an element of self-forgiveness. I think we're so unforgiving of ourselves, you know? And, and I feel that, um, and thirdly, if you really feel guilty about it, don't, don't, don't do it on those days then, right? And, and I have to share, you know, you started off by this whole like bad girl thing that, I mean, I, 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 I love to party. I love hanging out with my friends. And um, although I can't handle alcohol much anymore, there have been days where I've been shit-faced, surely. I've been walking the streets of New York. I've gone to crazy swingers clubs with my best friends and, you know, seen all the sexual acts possible and stared and gawked and been like, and my friends been like, Uluki patti ghurna band kar. And I'm like, nahi, mene saw daughter diye, mein dekhungi. And I'm walking back at six o'clock in the morning and I've got my heels in my hand and I'm stuffing my face with a pizza slice. And then I reach home and then I'm like, Baba ji, maaf nahi karenge. I will not be forgiven. I've sinned. And it's happened to me that I've bathed and bathed and bathed. And then I realized, okay, because I'm under the influence of alcohol, I'm feeling really guilty still. 
wake up in the morning and the hangover makes you feel horrible but then i i allow logic to sink in because guilt increases your anxiety it affects your mental health and then i'm like ninna so what you clubbed last night so what you went and saw this crazy shit in front of you it's okay so that self forgiveness i think is really important and believe me god forgives everything god loves everybody just the way they are so self forgiveness and a modicum of of practicality i would say i think that's extremely good advice i couldn't have said it better myself self forgiveness and a modicum of practicality and just logic yeah. and to stop the the guilt i think if everybody from this particular episode takes even that one thing away with them i'll be delighted because that is certainly the best advice that i have heard so far on this subject okay now there's something else that comes to mind a lot of people go on and on like i said you know when we started off about how bad it is um make you feel guilty make you feel judged and a lot of women out of sheer frustration will go towards celibacy what uh-huh. do you have to say about <laughs> that i know we talked um, about celibacy <laughs> um yeah so i actually had um a relationship uh, with a narcissistic um asshole uh, if i'm allowed to say that <laughs> and so what happened Absolutely. was that yeah so my mental health suffered tremendously i almost had like a nervous breakdown and not of my own doing but one of my closest friends said nina please make a vow of celibacy and i hated her in that moment because she was weeping her father had just died and she said i'm fed up of cleaning up your shit nina can you just refrain and i think the thing is when you um end a relationship and it's a nasty relationship it's so easy because you're damaged it's so easy to go uh, on a rampage you know in terms of uh, rebound sex and rebound relationships um but that ends up being so much more damaging is is what i found so what i did do was i made that vow sima i made that vow and um okay. uh, as weeks turned into months i realized that more than a physical and sexual detox it was a mental detox because it, it allowed me um the power of discernment so if i met somebody hmm you know all right but then you realize oh my god just so and so is good looking but there's no more there's no real substance to this person so it allows you this this uh, this power of discernment and mental detox so i recommend it to anybody especially if you've broken up especially if you're going through a trying time it's wonderful to try celibacy that's really good advice so we get a lot of people on both sides of the spectrum saying is this good or is this not good and a lot of people in recent times particularly the younger age group and amongst men in in particular mm-hmm. have been mm-hmm. talking about this no fap movement you know this thing of don't masturbate um be completely celibate and so on but i think that the way that you've just put it really puts it into perspective i like what you've said that it's not about taking a vow of celibacy to do away with your sexual desires which is most what most people think it is but to actually use celibacy just for a brief while for a contained amount of time to detox so that you can get better discernment so that you can actually see things more clearly you know um i don't know if you know sarvesh shashi the the guy who's a founder of sarva yoga so he's one of these uh, startup guys and he's doing very very well he's partnered with malaika arora and uh, i'm so bad with these names malaika arora and her sister whoever these the, these actors are so so he talks a lot he talks a lot about no fapping and especially for men that it's supposed to sort of you know bring up your spiritual powers and your intellectual powers i don't know about that but i i think that if you're uh, being celibate i think self pleasure should not be ruled out because it's a wonderful benign tool for you it doesn't take away problems but at least it empowers you um to not feel that sense of victimhood that comes with oh i'm single i can't be satisfied hell no you're single doesn't mean you can't be satisfied doesn't mean you can't have pleasure so that benign tool that you have of self pleasure use it till thy kingdom come is what my advice would be to everybody then now that's been a really enlightening conversation and thank you so much for your openness in suggesting and talking about things um and i i think i mean i certainly have got a lot out of it so i i'm hoping that everybody out there listening to us today will feel the same way but just before we uh, wrap up this conversation there's a couple of things that i'd like to get your advice on for our listeners so women in their 40s single again once again looking for relationships once again being out there in the world the dating scene has changed drastically 
I mean, I find some of the terminology absolutely alien to me. And I am in the field of, mm -hmm. um, you know, talking about sex and sexuality. So what I'd like you to talk about is just very briefly address the idea of polyamory, which is suddenly really in fashion at the moment. Then this thing about sexting, because sexting is not as simple and straightforward as just having sex on messages or sending graphic messages to each other. There's a whole different vocabulary around it. And there's a whole set of rules that have built up around it. Like you were telling me about something called ghosting. So if you could explain some of that for some of our, maybe not for the younger audiences who are listening to us, <laughs> but certainly for a lot of the others, uh, certainly for a lot of the others who wouldn't know about this. You know, so I've always heard about the word open marriages, but now what I've been seeing of late the last year or two is a lot of conversation around polyamory. And um, what, what that essentially means is that you're open to having multiple partners. You might have one person who you're anchored with, but then you're allowed to experiment. And there are many rules in place where, you know, if you're, if you're sleeping with somebody else, you have to inform your partner. There has to be a huge amount of uh, disclosure is what one of the bases of polyamory is. And a lot of trust, a lot of um, exchanges, a lot of confidence in your, in your primary relationship. Now, um, so this is not, it's not about cheating on the other person, you're but not actually cheating doing it with consent. With consent, openly saying, listen, I'm going out today with so-and-so. You, you, there can't be secrecy in it. There can't be secrecy because then the person who you're in a primary relationship in with will, will be uncomfortable. But I have to say, you know, my, my personal take on this and my, my sort of opinion on this is that I feel that monogamy to, in, in the first place, monogamous relationships in the first place are difficult enough to deal with in terms of their, its work, right? And there's so many dynamics. So when you bring somebody else into the equation or many other people, I don't know for the life of me how the dynamics work because there's so many tangential sort of, you know, uh, dynamics and conversations happening. But having said that, I mean, I'm noticing a lot of young people not only openly talking about it, but even putting it in their bios on Instagram. So saying I'm poly, I'm queer, uh, I'm, I'm bi. And I think that's um, really brave. And I, uh, I'd love to learn a little bit more about it. And I'm open to my opinion being changed. But so far, anybody I've seen in a poly relationship and without being judgmental, I feel it comes from a place of confusion because you're not sure about what you want because human beings, some people might say that you're born monogamous, uh, that, that, you're, that human beings are not supposed to be monogamous, but I feel that we're territorial. I'm not okay with sharing my friends half the time. How can you be okay sharing somebody you're being intimate with? So that's polyamory in my opinion. Um, but I think it's, it sounds very exciting. But again, I'd feel like a really bad girl if I did it. And then um, sexting, I, <laughs> Baba Ji will not forgive me, but um, sexting I think is a wonderful tool and um, I advise everybody to do it because there's a whole amount of playfulness. There's a whole amount of fantasy playing that can happen that you start dropping messages in the morning, hinting to your partner, even if you're at home, it's locked down, drop a message. I want to do this to you. I want to do that in the afternoon or just dropping hints here and there. And you have this sort of psychological advantage of being behind the phone. So you can say so much more, you know, and, but um, I think safety is really important. There's a lot of cyber crime that happens out there. So no distinguishable marks should be there in the photographs or videos that you exchange. Your face shouldn't be there. And consent, again, you don't want anybody sending you nudies without permission. So please don't go around sending nudies without asking. <laughs> and, um, and you said about ghosting, right? So yeah, yeah, I was just going to say that, um, you know, this idea of sending little messages is as old as time itself. So, you know, so that's message sent in the morning to prepare for the sexual act at night or even to sort of um, keep the excitement alive for a week uh, ahead. It's, it's something that they did in the time of the Kama Sutra. They just didn't have phones in those days, but they sent little really? other types of messages. So, yeah, yeah. So, you know, for instance, um, this whole idea of cinnamon. Um, if you sent a little pouch of cinnamon, it had a particular um, message with it. It, it had a, se a sexual message. A, a pouch of almonds had a whole different type of message to go with it. A piece of jewelry had a whole different, a different wow. type of manicure 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we always advise people from the Kama Sutra that if you get a manicure done, because love scratches were a very important part of your foreplay, uh -huh. uh, okay. you, you send your partner a, a photo of your new manicure. It's very exciting wow. and tells them that you're thinking about them in a very exciting way. Wow, wow. <laughs> yeah, and it's safe as well. It's not Absolutely. graphic. Yes, 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 yes. Wow. Okay. <laughs> But you were telling me about ghosting. Yes, um, I have to confess, I'm guilty of it also. Um, I think it comes from the, uh, the uh, from from two places. I think it comes from the problem of plenty, and it comes from the problem of having difficulty having difficult conversations. So there's so many options out there, right? When you're talking about the dating world, tuck 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 tuck, swipe right, swipe left. I can block you. I can delete you immediately. You know. Um, so the problem of plenty, you don't want to have difficult conversations. So you know what, if you don't fall in line with what I want or, or what, I, what, I, what I feel that I you know, desire, then move over. So it's very unfair actually when we end up doing that to people. And um, what actually ends up happening to the person that you ghost is that they end up feeling that there's something wrong with them. So what I really want to advise people who are at the receiving end is it's nothing to do with you. It's to do with the person who ghosted you because they have the inability to have difficult conversations. Or even to commit, I guess. To commit, absolutely, absolutely. That's interesting. So uh, ghosting is what, where you just block the other person after having had a you few just conversations and you think. Yes, so you block them or you stop responding and um, yeah, and you, it's very painful. It's very painful because you get no closure really. Oh, wow. Okay, well, thank you for explaining the ghosting to me. Um, so, Nina, in closing, if you have to give three bits of advice to our listeners out there of how to just maintain their, their balance, how to look after themselves, what would you say? Seema, did you realize that my new platform is called Pursuit of Balance? <laughs> That's so cool. I like the name Pursuit of Balance. Because I don't think we're ever completely balanced, so we're always in the pursuit. Um, so my advice to people would be um, love yourself, invest in yourself, um, be kind to yourself and to everybody around you as much as possible. Um, invest in your support systems, judiciously because that's what you're going to fall back on eventually take care of your mental health because that's all you have really in terms of your sanity and um, the most important I think is know when to walk away because that's respecting yourself and um, respecting your dignity then I think that's extremely good advice thank you for that and just one other thing that you mentioned earlier which really really struck a chord with me and I'd like to repeat that in closing. And that is, as Nina says, use the platforms of therapy that are available to you. So if you feel you cannot afford therapy, there are free places that you can go to. We have listed some of these links down in the description. Take a look at them, use them. A lot of people are very judgy about therapy. It's like, oh, this must be something wrong with you. What, you know, what is this nonsense about therapy? It's not. It's about your well-being. It's about you feeling good about yourself. So use the platforms of therapy. The other thing that Nina mentioned was about using celibacy for detoxing yourself. I know that a lot of people out there are talking about celibacy and a nofap and so on in many, many different aspects of it and many different platforms. But I love the idea of just using it as a detox um, tool. It's an amazing thing to try. It gives you more discernment. It gives you more perspective. Do it just for that. Do it for yourself. And on that amazing note, Nina, I want to say once again, thank you so much for being with us. We are really, really honored to have had you on the platform with us. And we think that people are going to get a lot out of this conversation. Thank you so much for having me, Seema. I'm honored to be here, to be honest. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed myself. So as always, uh, do comment, like, subscribe. Your questions should be addressed to info.seema.anand at gmail.com. If you need to get in touch with Dr. Anvita Madan Behel, she is on 
anvitamadanbehel.com. And if you wish to reach out to Nina Claire for her advice and guidance, you will find her on Instagram on Nina Claire, but spelled N-I-N-A-K-L-E-R. With that, have a wonderful week. We'll see you here next week.